Last week, you may remember, we had our first look at a really remarkable British success story. The story of Samuelsons, who 20 years ago started by hiring out just one camera and have now become the biggest film facilities company in the world. This is their headquarters in North London. So this week in Clapperboard, the Samuelson story, part two. Alongside your name on the front of the building is that of Panavision. Now the connection with them has been crucial to the company, hasn't it? Yes, it's been very important. What happened was that at that time, feature films in the widescreen process were mostly Cinemascope. Cinemascope was the start of the anamorphic format. But I noticed that more and more films seemed to be made in something called Panavision. And it seemed to be the best looking result that could be obtained. And I didn't know anything about them and they had no representation over here. So I took myself off to Los Angeles and I, I knocked on their door and I told them uh, what we did. Eventually, about a year later, in uh, 1965, we did become uh, the representative for Panavision throughout Europe. And that has brought into our company international filmmakers as customers who we may never have seen. So yes, having a great optical process like Panavision has been terribly important to us. And with Panavision came innovations like Panaglide. How revolutionary was that? Well, Panavision are constantly improving. The Panaglide is a what we call a floating camera. And uh, the best thing to do really is to look at it and you'll see it's easier to understand how it works. But it means that you can dash about over any kind of terrain and uh, the, this equipment smooths it all out so that you don't know uh, just how bad and how rough the surface is. The secret is that it's floating. You see, everything, all the movement is taken out by this system of bracketry. Now, if you hold it, Carl, you'll see that it enables the operator, who's not operating the camera, he's wearing the camera in a way, he can go over bad, tough, rough ground or upstairs or something, and the movement is not transmitted to the camera, the camera remains steady. Go on, guys, just try doing that. guy just jumps up and down, you'll see the camera is absolutely staying steady. Look at my hand, look at that movement. And that's the technique that we're talking about. Because the operator doesn't, he can't put his eye up against the camera because movement would be transmitted. So he has a TV finder so that he can keep his head right away from the camera and still see what it's getting. So there you are, that's the Panaglide and we've got a film we can show you where you'll be able to understand just what it can do. hiring equipment, Samuelsons, of course, create and make it. When did this research and development arm of the company, of which you're in charge, uh, start? Well, it goes right back to the very beginnings when Sydney and Michael and I were all working cameramen and could see the need for gadgets, improvements to equipment that we could buy, ways of putting two pieces of equipment that we could buy from different sources together. And so we used to have to make certain things ourselves. But really it was as a result of actually using the equipment. 
Um, many years ago, I was the first cameraman on World in Action for its first two years. And uh, I used to be out all day or for weeks on end abroad using the equipment and then I'd come back to base and say, well, if we had this with that and put this together with that, and we would do it. Well, you left school when you were a nipper. You were only about 14, so you had no engineering training at all, presumably. I didn't have any formal engineering training, but then I had the good fortune to go into the Air Force and um, did a, a, during the war or just after the war and did an engineering course there and that has stood me in good stead. I've always said that the, my period in the RAF was my university. Do Samuelson's inventions normally arise out of the need of a filmmaker or do you see a gap yourself and fill it? Well, I suppose it's, it's, it's both. Um, we have a need for putting various items together. For instance, we can buy 10 or 12 different makes of lenses and have seven different cameras with different mounting systems on them. And we need to be able to put any of those lenses onto any camera. Well, now to do this, we have to have an interfacing system and you just can't go out and buy this sort of thing. We have to make it. And then, of course, with various experiences and cameramen come to us with ideas, um, I spend a lot of time with cameramen working. One gets to know what they need and sees a way to do it. Did uh, Sam Cinevision, for instance, which has made life a great deal easier for directors, did that come out of a request? <clears throat> no, that really came out of um, seeing the very first closed circuit television camera that I'd ever seen. And I thought, wouldn't that be a good idea if we put it alongside a film camera on the same optical axis and um, so that the director and other people could see what the film camera operator was getting. Straight away. Straight away. Instead of having as to wait it was for the Russians. And this is going back to about 1960, long before I think anybody else had, had done this. The first one we called, we called it the UC2 viewfinder. The first major production that Sam Cinevision was used on was Oliver. And the reason they used it was to check lip movements and choreography when they were shooting to playback and very often the, the choreographer would say such and such a dancer was out of step and they'd look at the TV viewfinder playback and find that that person hadn't even been in picture at all. Similarly with lip movements if they were doubtful as to whether um, the lips were out of sync with the sound they could look at it and check and say yes it was good or no it wasn't good and that way it saved a lot of time. Uh, you talked about filters, the shimmering filter which uh, Ozzy Morris used in Scrooge was one of your inventions wasn't it? Well yes it was one of my inventions but I've since realized that it was a reinvention um, in that um, I had a filter that we'd bought it was an early star filter of a special type with very deep grooves in it and I moved it around while I was looking at somebody and I saw that it made the light all dance in various corners and I thought well, wouldn't that be a good idea so I made a special mounting to go in front of the camera that actually wobbled the filter while a shot was being taken to get this effect and recently um, as you may know I collect uh, film equipment and I'm somewhat of a historian of the technique of filmmaking I was recently given in Sweden a set of filters, one of which is a very old star filter, and I was told that on Garbo's first film, before she was discovered, she, the, the cameraman used to put this filter in front of the lens and wobble it around, and it used to make the highlights of her eyes all shimmer, and this is what sold her to, to Hollywood. Scrooge, Ozzy Morris had a scene to do there with lights, candles on it, and by using the shimmering filter he was able to make those lights flicker and shimmer and sparkle, and with all the little tiny pinpoints of light that there were on the set, it looked very exciting. Never? Yet how many of my brothers have you rejected in your miserable lifetime? I have never met any of you brothers, sir. You have never looked for them? Well, how many of them are there? What year is this? 1860. Then I have 1859 brothers. Each year at this time, one of us visits this puny little planet 
to spread some happiness and to remove as many as we can of the causes of human misery. Which is why I have come to see you, Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> You're a funny looking little creature. I must admit, I found it hard to believe you'd be as horrible as my brother said you'd be. But now that I look at you, I can see they were understating the truth. Let me assure you that I am a man of the highest principles and the most generous spirit. Generous spirit? You? You don't know the meaning of the phrase. What about the inclining prism that you came up with? Is that, is that new as far as you can tell? That is new, and indeed I've got patents on it all, all over the world. Um, somebody gave me a book of all the different prisms that it was possible to, um, to make. And there's one that I saw there which um, is used on the eyepiece of a telescope so that the telescope could look upwards and the, as, uh, the astronomer looked directly into it. And I thought, well, wouldn't that be a good idea instead of putting it on the eyepiece if you put it in front of the lens and then you could get down very low, um, rather like a mirror, but um, without the picture being reversed from side to side and um, without any loss of quality. And so I had one of these prisms made and it worked and now I've got all, they're all over the world. The prism is obviously a, a delicate mechanism, but another new Samuelson line sounds a fairly vast object, the Lumar crane. What's that designed to do? Well, that's a joint effort between our Paris office and London. It's a way to put a camera on the end of a long boom up to seven meters long and to put it into a remote place and move it around without, with the operator being separated from the camera so that it's possible to put cameras where they've never been before to put them into places, to move them up and down. It gives a whole new dimension to, to film movements, camera movements. You had an outing in Moonraker, I think. Yes, it's been used in Moonraker. It was used on Superman. And it's just been used for eight months in Hollywood on Steven Spielberg's latest picture, 1941. And indeed, at one time, they were sharing the Lumar crane, the first one, between Moonraker and Steven Spielberg and flying it backwards and forwards across the Atlantic. To carry these uh, clever devices, you've even adapted vehicles, haven't you? Yes, um, we've done quite a lot with vehicles. It goes back to when we supplied a mini moke for um, Frankenheimer on Grand Prix, and I saw them one day with that poor mini moke absolutely loaded to the gunnels and down low at the back, and I thought, well, what a shame to do that to a vehicle. Why don't we put an extra two wheels on the back? So we bought all the spare parts for the, the, the rear three feet of a mini moke and welded them back to back with the other part. And so we made a six-wheeler and called it a mook instead of a moak. Traditionally, uh, you've literally done a package deal. I mean, you haven't only created equipment and hired it, but actually put it in boxes of your own making, haven't you? Yes, well, we've always made our own boxes, mainly for the convenience of being able to, when we get a new piece of equipment, to be able to case it up as soon as we can to get it into service. But really, it goes back to our very, very first beginnings when we bought our first cameras and couldn't afford the cases. So I, I used to make them myself. My hobby at that time was carpentry and I made the first cases in, the, in my garage at home. But now we've developed a line of rigidized aluminum cases, uh, which are very good. Being an old cameraman myself, I know that cameramen, if they're to use cases to look after the equipment, have to have cases that are lightweight and easy to use and clean. And in making our present cases, I think that we've advanced the development there quite a lot. Tony, this, the latest Samuelson venture, is your brainchild. What are you building here exactly? Well, I don't think we're building anything. We're really adapting a whole crowd of old buildings, which we came by more or less by accident when we bought the premises next door to house our lighting company. What are you adapting them for? Um, well, they're studios, but um, they're the kind of studios that are most practical for the production of television commercials. They're not studios in the tradition of Pinewood or 
from Shepparton or elsewhere. What persuaded you there was a need for them? Are there not other commercial filmmaking centres around London? Well, there's been a shortage of that kind of studio in recent years. And um, we like to sort of get involved in things. And so I suppose um, it was just something that we had the bills, so they, they were an obviously interesting and exciting thing to do something with. And that was the most appropriate thing to do with them. How many studios are you, are you adapting? There will eventually be nine which the largest is 10,000 square feet, which is quite a respectable size. They're not for exclusively studio. for commercial work, are they? No, no. It's possible... I mean, you can, for example, now make very good feature films entirely on location. So the studios don't have to be enormous and grand any longer. And uh, we have, in fact, got a, uh, a feature film production in here at the moment. That's Rock Follies, is it? Yes. yes. So I see the name on the, on the house over there. Yes, that's right. What is this building behind us? That doesn't look like a studio. Well, all studios have to have um, a decent place to retire at the end of the day's filming in order to get one's um, strength up for the next day. <laughs> so that is going to be the studio pub. And it's uh, going to be called The Magic Hour, which is a good emotive film industry expression and um, that should be ready I would think in about uh, another month or so's time. You've named other sort of alleyways and cubby holes for emotional reasons I noticed too. Well yes principally I think Burroughs Yard over there which um, is named after the Burroughs in Hendon which is three miles up the road and it was at the Burroughs in Hendon that Samuelson Film Service really got its start and uh, it, it, did, it really started in Crespigny Road in Hendon which was my brother's semi-detached house at the time. You're a lawyer by training aren't you? How did you come to be adopted as the financial wizard of Samuelson's? Well I haven't practiced since 1953. In fact um, some of my clients are just beginning to come out of prison so it's a rather <laughs> anxious time for me. Um, but uh, I don't know. Sydney got um, uh, Sydney bought his first camera, and um, as you may have already heard, and he seemed to think that was a it, it was in fact a great success. Yes, we've heard the early history. And so he asked Michael and I and David if we'd like to come in on the second camera, and little by little we all got involved. But they at least had some cinematic experience. You had none, either cinematic or financial then, did you? No, well, none at all. None at all. I'm not even saying that I've got any now. So you picked it up while you were at it, as it were? Well, you're saying that. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not claiming it, I'm not admitting well, it. Well, it's looking fairly successful from where yes. I'm standing. You seem to have everything in Samuelson's now. You have the equipment which you hire out, all manner of equipment. You have the studio space. Your father, I think, advised the boys or some of them not to go into production but that would seem to be a logical move for Samuelson's now where will they move from here well I don't think we will I, I don't think for a moment so that we will go into production uh, apart from anything else uh, it would bring us into competition with our customers and I can't believe that that is what we ought to be doing so is there anywhere left for the company to move any more mountains to climb I think we would like to get the production village on its feet before we even begin to think it. Uh, I think it is undoubtedly the biggest new venture that we have undertaken. And uh, although it's going extremely well, there's a still a lot here to be done, as you can see. And uh, let's get that one out of the way first. Tony, thank you very much. Thank you. From that one camera you started with, just what is the range of the equipment you can offer for hire now? Well, as far as, if you don't mind the term, hardware is concerned, we can provide everything in the way of cameras, 16 and 35 millimeter, uh, sound recording equipment, editing, lighting, specialized transport, cranes, dollies, pretty well everything that is needed 
to make a film. There are some areas that we're not involved in at all. We're not in props, we're not in costumes, we're not in uh, what the Americans call talent. We don't have to do with the front of camera people. Uh, we're behind the camera, fairly anonymous. We don't put our name on any of our trucks. Why is that? We feel that as we're always working for other people, in other words, the producers of the film are our customers, we're not normally the producers. Uh, if they take a truck full of equipment, they're entitled not to have Samuelson's advertising on the side. We have a fairly distinctive livery so that uh, everybody in the trade knows that they're our trucks, but we don't have uh, our names all over them. Do you think that the future of the industry is going to drift increasingly away from film towards electronic cameras? No, I think that um, there is going to be an increasing large amount of both. I think that with the advent of video discs and video cassettes and videograms and video this and video that, the demand for material is increasing at such a rate that we shall need to have both ENG and video systems as well as film. And the film is going up at the moment, not down. David, thank you very much. And you haven't just attracted international producers. You now have bases abroad yourselves. Yes, we have a branch in Paris and in Australia. They're the principal overseas branches, and then we're in Johannesburg as well. Just to demonstrate how dramatic the, the growth graph is, could you put a figure on the, on the amount of rentable hardware you have now to compare it with that 300 quid you raised for your second camera? I'd, I... You gulped rather nervously when I said that. No, it was just because um, I could detect what you were going to ask me, and I don't know the actual figure. I can get it for you, but it's several million pounds. Today, the production village is almost complete, and unlike most studio complexes, it looks as though somebody's actually taken the trouble to plan it, and someone who, in defiance of the North London sprawl, clearly has a taste for the rural. Now that the builder's rubble has been cleared away, even a village pub has emerged, the magic hour. Several major features have already been based here, and one, breaking glass, used the village for most of its interiors. Its primary purpose, though, is to service commercials, and a good many have been made on its stages. <laughs> 